Genesis Foundation. Dub Lab. Welcome to the Quarantine Tapes, a daily podcast from Onassis LA and Dublin. Hosted by Paul Holden Graber, this series chronicles shifting paradigms in the era of social distancing. Hello? Hello, could I please speak with Edwidge Danticat? This is she. Edwidge, it's such a pleasure to to speak with you. This is Paul Holdengraber calling you, and I'm I'm so happy that you're you're part of the quarantine tapes. I really, really wanted you to be a part of it. As a matter of fact, I just really want to talk to you all the time, but don't have occasion to do so very often. So thank you, thank you for graciously accepting. How are you? I'm fine, and thank you. Thank you for calling. It's always wonderful to, to speak to you. Likewise, likewise. It, it really, I really felt that I needed to talk to you in this time. I remember a conversation we had, well, we've had so many, but one of the conversations we had at the New York Public Library around the publication of your book, The Art of Death, Writing the Final Story, and I've had occasion now to go back to it and to go back to your work, generally speaking, and to read all the extraordinary essays you've been writing in the New York Times. And there's one line in, in The Art of Death which struck me, I mean, so many, but this one where you say, I have been writing about death for as long as I have been writing. And it made me think of our present time and how sadly qualified you are to speak at this moment. Well, I think um, we're all going to be very qualified, sadly, soon to speak about different aspects of this. But, um, you know, the other day I was um, part of my, uh, I guess, the quarantine watching or these documentaries, and I stumbled on one on Susan Sontag and um, and the way she wrote about illness and and um and death and and what she you know things she has written over the years on the subject and i i was also reaching for experts and um but it's been it's been also interesting to have friends now reach out and say you know i've i've lost a loved one and i was going through your book and and even myself you know there are uh, people now elders in my life people i've known since I was a teenager, who were friends of my parents who have passed away. Um, and the and the way that funerals have happened these days where, you know, you get a you get a code and you're supposed to either watch it on Zoom or FaceTime or I mean it's a really it's it's new territory for all of us, whether we're talking about life and death. It's it's really I mean, the word unprecedented keeps getting used, but it's really uh, extraordinary. And and in terms of the language and emotions that it requires to just to just live through, with all the inequalities, with all the the also the the, the layers of society that this moment is revealing, but also just generally the very basics of the fragility of life and the constant proximity of death, which we have talked about before you know, in regard to the book. We, we did talk about it. What was interesting to me just in this short moment is how much you said in, 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 in this brief response to, to your own sentence from the art of death and how you re- reach out to voices like uh, Susan Sontag and and how literature in in some sense may offer um, if not answers at least a, a deeper way of experiencing the present if one is so inclined and I was I was thinking about um, an, an essay of, of Toni Morrison where she writes um, and I know it's an essay that matters to you greatly, the ancestor as foundation. She writes, it mm-hmm. seems to me interesting to evaluate black literature 
on what the writer does with the presence of an ancestor. Ancestors are not just parents, they are sort of timeless people. I'm curious how this passage at this moment strikes you. Well, one of the things that, I mean, that that passage does, it, it makes me miss her even more, but it also reminds you that she is one of these elders that I wouldn't want to be worrying about in this moment. And we have um, so many who are with us still that, you know, who have given us great work and you, and you just, you're like, hold on, don't go outside. <laughs> you want yeah. to, you want to, you want to keep them, you know, treasured and, and, and safe. But it's true. I think um, what many of us, you know, I guess with, you know, especially speaking from as a member of the African diaspora, what many of us um, have always known is, is in, in so many ways, we have always been operating in the presence of, of these ancestors, as was she, you know, Toni Morrison. Um, and now she's an ancestor um, too. But that, there's, there's, a line, there's a lineage, a thread that I think has, um, and, and, in the culture that I come from, I'm, I'm Haitian, and but also I think in many African diaspora cultures that there's a kind of continuity that that we feel that we're a part of. Um, it doesn't make us immune to pain. It doesn't make us Hardly. less afraid of death, death necessarily. You know, actually, it's probably the reverse. But but I think there's a spiritual component of continuity that um, that even when we are gone physically in this body, we still exist as, as ancestors. Um, contrast that, you know, at the same time with what we've been hearing on the news with the higher percentage of African-Americans um, and, in, and in some areas, Native Americans and uh, other vulnerable populations um, who have, because of inequalities in healthcare and other great system, you know, system inequalities, are also suffering more from this um, this illness. So at the same time, you have these layers of of inequality, of injustice that that also this pandemic is peeling back. That gives us pause to consider about like what 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 kind of society, <laughs> what kind of world is this? Um, it and might, and it, I think it, that's it, what it might bring to 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 the foreground. What kind of society? we've been living in not that that kind of society was hidden from your eyes but it can easily mm -hmm. it can easily be hidden from one's eyes when one is so occupied or preoccupied or busy and the lack of busyness yes. now in a sense if there is a silver lining to any of this it might be that we are beginning to see some of the disparities and you know this disparity you talk about we're not all equal uh, when it comes to, to this virus. It's something that Kianga Yamata-Taylor spoke to on this very quarantine tapes, just the extraordinary disparity between the African-American uh, communities and other communities, and a very, very sad fact of what is happening now. But maybe people will take notice, will take notice of... Yeah. Perhaps. I mean, I, I, I really think perhaps. When your mother died, you turned to the book of Revelation. And I am wondering, you know, you, you, you said the, the plethora of gloomy imagery in a way comforted you. And I'm, I'm wondering what, what do you turn to now? Well, I'm, um, the, now the book of Revelation is just too gloomy for me. It's just it's too much. I um, and it it's actually it actually was my mother I think was very fascinated by it and I realized towards the end of her life that she might have been because she grew up a Jehovah's Witness and Jehovah's Witnesses are sort of trained to anticipate the end times and I and I sometimes think just as I I wonder how Ms. Morrison might have interpreted this moment you know both the the historical inequalities but also this. Uh, the strong spiritual thread that also exists in her work and the biblical elements that she pulls in. I always also wonder what my mother would have thought. And I know because I'm also, I live with my 85-year-old mother-in-law who is 
to her, it's the, you know, it's prophesied, you know, mm. um, it's, it's, it's mm. the prophecies coming true. And, and, and I spoke to one of my parents, who's very over 90, a gentleman who's over 90, who I check in on regularly. He said, you know, we're paying for our sins. Like that's how he's paying. That's his um, interpretation of it. So that, that I feel like I get that orally, <laughs> but, so, but I'm a, I'm a sadly a very terrible news junkie, which is bad for you because then, then, you know, combine that with the imagination that, that I think as a creative person you have, you just kind of spiral and, and I have to, there are nights when I can't sleep really. Like I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stare at the wall or I'll wake up at 3 a.m. and I, and it's not at a state where I can get up also and write. It's just kind of a state of worry, um, not just for myself, but for my family, my family in Haiti. And Haiti is a place that is so vulnerable, would be so vulnerable to this, with the healthcare. Yes, so I worry about people in Haiti. And, and so there is a, a, a spiral. But I, 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 I love to read certain um, great minds um, who are also writing about this. Like I, you know, I think that Zadie Smith has a beautiful piece this week. I mean, it's a really powerful. I think it came last week online in the New Yorker called The American Exception. Mm. And where she sort of puts the, she has that, so that, that way of just framing like the big picture for us in such few words. And that was um, comforting to read. I, um, I did go back and because everyone was reading it and I'm such a big, big fan of Camus, I went back and, and reread La Peste, you know, the, the plague. And you know and, that, and you know and that I, the book is, is sold out in Italy. I know. Yeah, I know. They, I they, it's, they, it's they sold, sold out everywhere. It sold 60,000 copies. It's interesting, no? Uh, I, mean, I mean, because it's, I realized, you know, there's some things I had forgotten about it, but when you read it, it's almost like a blueprint for this, for this moment in terms of the initial denial, right? And then it's sort of like people trying to, like the, the, like the hoarding, do we have enough mass? Do we have enough supplies? And the, there's the journal, you know, like how are the things important? But I think what I, what I, uh, take away from it the most is at the end when, um, you know, Ryu is the only one who the doctor is the only one who, who is not initially just rushing out and celebrating, you know, and, and he basically realizes that I think I have the quote. It says, and indeed, as he listened to the cries of joy rising from the town, Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled. He knew that those jubilant crowds did not know but could have learned from books that the plague bacillus never dies or disappears for good, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture, in linen chests, and that it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, and booksellers, and that perhaps the day would come when, for the bane and enlightening of men, it would rouse up its wrath again and send them forth to die in a happy city. I mean, it's not a very happy thought, but it's no. kind of, I mean, it's just, it, it echoes a lot to like what my mother used to say, and we've talked about that, it's about how we all are walking around with our coffins under our, you know, under our arms, you know, and that's, you know, and, you know, like in life, there is also death. And, and if we, if we, if we work, around like communally with that thought in mind which was like the end of the Camus we would have more of a desire to protect one another to you know to be mindful to not buy all the bread that's left or do all these you know all these things that I think would make us a better society so I yeah I went back and read that actually when I, I was a little bit embarrassed when I went to the store to books and books my wonderful local independent bookstore that wonderful, sadly wonderful. since closed. Yeah. And so when I went to get that, like I, there were three copies on the shelf and I got one and I felt a little bit embarrassed like to like to go and check it out because it seemed gloomy. But I, but I, I knew that there was, I mean, like that's why probably so many people are going for it, you know, reaching for it is the sense that of like, oh, this is not, you know, in some ways this has happened before. And and let us be reminded of the lessons that we need to learn from it. 
you know, to, today um, is a birthday of, of so many extraordinary writers, whether it's Eudora Welty or Beckett or Seamus Heaney, and I think particularly of Christopher Hitchens, who I had also the occasion to speak mm. to two days before he went to hospital. His penultimate uh, conversation was at, at the, the New York Public Library, and he, he said in it something that uh, echoes so much the thoughts of Annie Dillard, as you mentioned them in your book. Um, he said that one should try to write as if posthumously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that makes me really, I mean, you, you, you it gasped, I gasped when I first read it. And, and then, you know, and then, you know, Dillard pushes it and she said, um, we should write as though we were, like, we had a terminal, Patient, like, yeah. illness, which in the case all of us have, she said, because, you know, because the, ultimately we will die. Um, we are trying, you know, as Zadie uh, says in, in, in her piece, or the American exception, where she said, we're trying to lengthen that dash between the date of our birth and the date of our death. We all are, but but we know that sort of like we exist um, ultimately um, within within that dash. But that makes me, it makes me so curious. And I think that's why I'm, I, I love also reading what people are writing in the instant, right? Like how they're recording. It makes me so curious to see what we'll, what, what we'll get to read from this moment that we've all shared with so many people around the world. And the other day in the Times, I saw that in Italy, for example, they're rushing out narratives of this. And they'll be curious to see, it because so much of this we haven't seen before. So they'll be curious to see how things are, like these intimate things, maybe they're doctors, maybe they're writers, maybe, you know, how these things are, are written that come back so quickly to us, right? Without, do they come back as poems? Do they come back as essays? Do they come back as reportage? And so it'll be interesting to see what, what writers make of this moment, and both in the heat of it as they're, you know, as they're, as they're at home, but also to see what how they interpret it. You know, I think Camus wrote his, um, you know, pretty distant from the, the particular plague that he was writing about, but it was supposed to be, I think, uh, it's interpreted often as a response to fascism and the, and the moment he was living in, but it would be interesting to see what we make of this moment. What, what is so extraordinary, Edwidge, is that as you say all this, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking... What will Edwidge Danticat make of this moment? What will we read of hers that comes out well, of this moment? I mean, you're writing essays, as I said. I, I call them essays because they really are essays in the New York Times um, about this and about uh, uh, in, in, literary, in the literary hub there was a, a, an extract from a piece you wrote. But I'm, I'm curious, will... Will this find a, its way into your essay writing or into your fiction? Um, you don't have well, to, you don't have to answer, but I'm just curious. No, no, I yeah, I mean definitely. I've written. Um, I'm trying to do what I want my girls to do, and I and I'm sort of you know I have two girls at home, and we're doing that the home teaching thing now, and I. And I keep telling them, I said, Noon, you have to keep a journal, right? Keep a journal because you're reading unprecedented times, you know, they're living in unprecedented times. And I said this to my my um, niece, who's, in, who's a junior in college, and she said, oh, uh, the, when the historians go back, they'll just read Facebook and Instagram. <laughs> so, so she kind of killed my, my push for handwritten um, journaling, she's like, oh, there'll be plenty of material because everybody's like, Don't give like up, TikTok, no. like, yeah. <laughs> she said, yeah. I know she said, but I, but I hadn't thought of that when she said it. She said, oh, the friends will just look at TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and they'll get a gist of what was happening. But I'm still, you know, so I am. I mean, for me, I'm trying to, you know, I've written two things, I think, um, but you know, that I'm trying to capture what I'm feeling but also to capture a sense of what's happening in my, around me. And by around me, I mean, 
in my specific community gives me an opportunity to talk to people in the community who work with, you know, with the most vulnerable people in, in my community, which in this case is in Little Haiti and Miami, and people who work in immigration. Um, you know, to this, this, this last week, they were deporting um, people to countries, you know, to, to Haiti, but also to, to quite a few other countries in our region, countries that have said, you know, that would be, or some places are already um, really struggling with a few cases of, of this virus, and, and it would be devastating to have more exposure. So there's deportations, there's people who are uh, DACA, you know, the, uh, who are uh, childhood arrivals, who work in the healthcare and are working, you know, at any time there's discussion that they might lose their status. And there's so much happening. And in, 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 so I'm trying to put my, like look at that, like the things that are happening in, in my individual environment and sort of like try to share that with others as much as I can, and contribute to have, that as much as I can. And you always could. have, um, mm. you know, I, your parents took you to see detention centers in Brooklyn when you were young, and you have taken your yeah. children to see detention centers at the border. Um, and Yeah, uh, and, I think, you yeah. know. In, in a sense, why? What And what happens when you see reality with your own eyes? It's not second hand your experience is not second hand it's not something you were talking earlier about reading the newspapers too much and watching the news too much i i you you'll be interested to know that on the quarantine tapes i interviewed pico aya who said one should look at the news five minutes a day or less oh no he's so good you know he's you know, Pico, who I, I love him so much, but he's a saint. Like, I can't aspire to, <laughs> to his height of wonderfulness. But, um, but I, think, I think this is, this is what, as this goes on longer and longer, and more of the layers of it is revealed, um, it goes back to what we were talking about before, there, that there's a kind of continuity to inequality, to... Uh, to imbalances that this is part of and so for for a lot of people and we're seeing that with with the with the mortality rates and, and so forth this just continues and drags on and worsens something that's that's been there and, and others have not known about so for example the fact that you know you have these heightened deportation. So there are people who are like, yeah, this is our opportunity to, right. to close borders, to, to, to hurt people who are already, who are already hurt. Catast so I think catastrophe, that's also... Catastrophes bring a, about possibilities, opportunities, both negative and positive. Yes. And I, and, I, and I think it's important to keep an eye on those things because so much can be, you know, in the name of, of quote-unquote protecting the larger society, then greater injustices could be done to populations that are already vulnerable. So, so that like what a lot of what's happening in immigration right now. So, I that I'm looking at that. Of course, I'm looking at you know just that I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about of course the larger uh, pictures, but I but you also look around the the the, the community. Um, but I think I, I think ultimately. Hopefully we will all come out of this a little bit wiser, a little bit more grateful for sure. We hope. Because, uh, we, we hope. We yeah. Hope. And you yeah. know, there, there is an essay um, of yours. Uh, uh, I call it an essay because it really is uh, that you wrote in the, the New Yorker um, to mark the 10th anniversary of um, the earthquake in Haiti, which made me think of, a, mm -hmm. of an extraordinary line by Nina Simone, where she says, what kept me sane was knowing that things would change, and it was a question of keeping myself together until they did. In this essay, I'm going to quote it, and then I want you to comment on it. It's an essay that I read nearly as some of the, the most extraordinary uh, Jewish messianic essays with the word repeated again and again and again and again of what if, what if, what if. You say, 
sorrowful anniversaries inevitably make us wonder what might have been, what if 316,000 people, the death count according to the government estimates, had not perid, perished? What if Haiti had actually been built back better as President Bill Clinton, who served in a triple role as United Nations Special Envoy for Haiti International Co-Chair of the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission and one of the two presidential faces of the Clinton and Bush Haiti Fund had often promised. What if the $13.5 billion in pledged and donated funds had actually been dispersed and invested in improving the lives of most Haitians, creating genuine paths for a better future? What if more seismic resistant homes, hospital schools and universities had been built or rebuilt to reduce future casualties? What if rural entrepreneurs, women, organizations and peasant farmers who face a brunt of diminishing food production, environmental degradation, deadly hurricanes, and climate change had been integral players in the reconstruction plans. And then in italics, what if? So mm -hmm. Edwidge, what if? Yeah. Well, we're, we're already asking in this situation, what if, right? Um, I think Dr. Fauci, uh, got into trouble a little bit this weekend with the with well the president let's say who hates people taking away, attention away from him. But what if like so many people are you know we cannot what if say certain things had been done sooner? What if this hadn't been called a hoax? I think that's always you know those those things are always in the back of our minds and and um, and what you hope. Is is that we learn something from the from the moment? It, but we're, there's such a void of of like leadership. Uh, there's you know in this administration, there's a clear priority over of of like the market over people's lives as expressed. So clear, very clearly. So clearly sometimes, no? yes, yeah, so, yeah, so clear. yeah. So clear. Um, and there's it, no it, no ambiguity with that at all. So. But, I mean, I think we'll be, if we're following the science, right, there's now, uh, people are saying, this can come back in the fall. And and if you're, those of us who are parents, and, and I'm, I fall within the gap of like of having um, youngish children and then also living with an older person, you're sort of in the middle and you're, you're thinking ahead. What is it going to look like in the summer? What is it going to look like in the fall when schools reopen? And, and all you hope is that we won't be asking, like, what if we had done this? What if we had done that? If this thing reoccurs in the fall? So, I mean, I think that the what if is helpful if, if people are reflective and can learn from a certain kind of situation. But it sure is powerful when the um, when it's a kind of response to, to to a lack of action that and and no lessons at all were learned. Edwidge, I can't tell you how meaningful it is for me to to speak to you each and every time, and I want to tell you one of my uh, dreams. One of my dreams is to go with Edwidge Danticat to Haiti. And film, mm -hmm. film you there with people who matter to you and take you also to where my father and mother were in Kenskov um, in 1938 to 1944. My father as a medical student from Vienna becoming a farmer in Haiti. And for us to discuss both of those destinies in one form or another. That is what I want to do when when this uh, pandemic uh, flattens, as they say now. I want to take that trip with you. That's what I dream about. Yes. That's what I dream about when, well, I, when I'm not anxious. Well, thank you. It'll be a wonderful thing to look forward to on the other side. Absolutely. Well, we'll me, have to do it. It's a date. It's a date. And from this side, Edwidge, thank you so much. And um, I, could, Thank you. I could continue and continue and my very best to all of your family and we'll, we'll speak again and we'll meet again and we'll talk again and we'll travel again. All the best to you. Thank you, Paul. 
Bye bye. Thank you. Stay well. Bye bye. To support this show and Dublab's progressive programming, go to dublab.com/support.